Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends and colleagues, it's a good thing to see uh, again familiar faces after this uh, uh, virtual connecting uh, connected world. Uh, this panel is going to address the, the, the allied options for threatened cross-domain deterrence. And uh, I think that by itself, this title, uh, the title of this discussion um, uh, shows how much uh, we've been facing for a few years, maybe for a few decades, uh, transforming, deeply transforming space context has been evoked uh, here and there since the beginning of our discussions. Uh, space finds itself at the center of, uh, uh, I would say, a more and more complex network of issues, whether uh, we're talking about uh, the number of diversity of objects that have been launched uh, for, for a long year, for many years now, the number of diversity of space players, whether they are states, emerging states, whether they are private operators, and the ever-increasing risk and threats, and we evoked also that in the previous panel, that we've been witnessing uh, over the last decade. All of these indicators have been flashing, uh, and uh, they inform us about all these uh, simultaneous transformations. And in the meantime, uh, our society have become space addict in a sense. Uh, we've been become hyper-dependent um, on a possibly, of a possibly more risky and less and less predictable space environment. And uh, we know that space uh, risk and threats have multiplied and, and it's increasing. So we're in a bit of a contradictory situation, becoming even more dependent on an even more risky environment. Though in this context, um, a key question is of course, and it's the uh, topics of this panel, is how to define uh, new standards for deterrence, uh, for preventing things to getting worse, and um, how space, present, and future developments may impact the very nature of this deterrence and, and its perimeter. Um, since the, the, given this intricate nature of, uh, of um, factors to take into account, um, what are the technical and, and political conditions to make the notion of deterrence real and even threatens for space? So we can think, of course, about a number of uh, elements, and these, they have all been, they've all been uh, uh, mentioned today already. Better space situation awareness, we've even had this notion of having a space domain awareness, uh, well, you have, of course, this military-civilian discussion, this public-private discussion, uh, creating a whole mesh. You know, the point is to create a whole mesh of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, allowing of, of sensors and all this, allowing an almost organic awareness uh, about what's going on in space. We need to know what's going on in space quickly and almost intuitively, and we're not there yet. Uh, we could talk about the necessary increased reliance on new players. We have a lot of new players different from one country to another, and it's uh, getting uh, bigger and bigger. And of course, and it's been also mentioned, the development of counter space programs uh, in addition to all this. So it takes us to the political conditions. And uh, uh, maybe a key issue is Conciling deterrence defensive countermeasures, legitimate ones, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the necessary increased transparency we all need. And that might be a key element of a possible way forward. How to make sure that our space assets are well protected while they've been, they've been protected in a responsible manner and in a collective manner. So we talked about transparency, and that may be also at the center of our discussions about deterrence, even if also we have had this remark this morning, Russians may be less um, eager to protect the space environment. Let's, let's question that. Let's see what it means. We're all interdependent in space, and that's going to be a real issue we have to uh, question, maybe in this panel. So I won't be longer than that, and I will now give the floor and hand over to uh, Pete. 
uh, Pete Hayes, and uh, Pete, you have the floor. Well, great. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you, and I'd like to thank Roger and Yana for their uh, tremendous uh, hospitality and, uh, again, hosting a very uh, successful conference. So this is uh, the premier event in uh, space conferences uh, every time you host it. So um, when I was thinking about um, how to frame up these comments and um, you know what I ought to focus on, uh, we're supposed to be looking at uh, deterrence, space, um, the context of uh, what's going on with the war in Ukraine is clearly very important. I think nuclear weapons are also really important. So those are things that, um, to me, have to be addressed and I'd also like to frame it up in the context of uh, something that General Shaw mentioned uh, before uh, lunch, and that was that um, one of the things that might keep him up at night is concerns about the growing vulnerability of space assets and how that might um, move us from a situation where they provide a strategic advantage to perhaps one of a strategic disadvantage because of all the vulnerabilities that those systems uh, possess. Um, I would think about that perhaps in Clausewitzian terms. Um, Carl von Clausewitz talked about uh, culmination points, and that's a point at which or beyond which a defense is no longer uh, possible. So I would submit that um, militaries around the world, the space forces and other groups that are um, thinking about how to uh, employ space forces need to consider that concept because I do think there are a lot of vulnerabilities uh, inherent to space capabilities, and maybe we are approaching uh, culmination points. So uh, the, the specific thing I wanted to talk about is something I don't think that has been addressed at all um, so far, and that is how uh, space-based strategic defenses might strengthen deterrence. And uh, you might think that this is something that was uh, reviewed and uh, put to bed during the Cold War, but I would submit to you that um, given the context of the Ukrainian uh, invasion and um, particularly President Putin's nuclear saddle or uh, saber rattling, um, it's something that is imperative for us to look at more closely. So um, uh, what I could say then uh, as well is that uh, when we go back and look at what the United States has done with those kinds of systems, uh, it might be really important to review that in the context of, of Ukraine. So recently, the United States has declassified quite a bit of specific information about a system that was known as uh, Brilliant Pebbles. So Brilliant Pebbles are uh, small, autonomous, about a, a, a meter long uh, space vehicle, uh, weighed a couple hundred uh, kilograms. Uh, they were never built. But what most people uh, don't realize is that um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1989 approved going ahead with what was known as the Phase I architecture of the uh, Brilliant Pebbles program. And the specific design criteria that they were looking to address was um, using 4,000 Brilliant Pebbles to attrit 50% of the Soviet SS-18 ICBM force. So 4,000 individual satellites um, in low Earth orbit that would use kinetic kill mechanism to attrit 50% of the SS-18 force. Um, much of the received wisdom about Brilliant Pebbles, in my judgment, um, tends to center around things like, oh, well, that would be too destabilizing, it would be too expensive, it would be too uh, technologically challenging. I think all of that received wisdom is wrong. And if you think that um, we couldn't intercept an ICBM in 1989, uh, or we couldn't do it today with the improved technology, you're wrong. Um, this is not that hard. It's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to hide the signature of a ballistic missile. So there are many ways to detect that and to um, one of the fathers of uh, Brilliant Pebbles, uh, Dr. Lowell Wood at the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory uh, talked about uh, bending the orbit of a uh, Brilliant Pebble. So he's saying that you use the orbital velocity of this autonomous kill vehicle to intercept a ballistic missile while it's rising up out of the atmosphere. 
Uh, I will also submit to you that that is the only current technology that affords an ability to do global boost phase defense. And there are many, many advantages to doing boost phase defense, uh, principally the fact that you take out all the uh, warheads uh, that uh, have not yet fragmented uh, with multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles. So again, it's a very uh, highly visible target. It is highly targetable from space by bending the orbital velocity of these vehicles. And uh, in my judgment, there's just no question that that technology would work. All right, so um, those are the details about uh, what happened. Again, the political um, received wisdom is, you know, too expensive, too destabilizing, too technologically challenging. Uh, but really, the answer to why we didn't go forward to that it was a political decision. 1989, the wall came down. The feeling was that nothing like this is needed anymore. Um, it was going to be quite expensive. It was uh, estimated to cost about $10 billion for a 30-year uh, design life of uh, 4,000 uh, satellite constellation in that phase one ballistic missile defense architecture. So that is a lot of money, absolutely. But the United States since 1983 has spent over $150 billion on strategic defense capabilities. Another thing I would just submit to you is that I, I mentioned that this is the only system that affords uh, global boost phase defense. Uh, another real specific critique of Brilliant Pebbles is that they had a high absentee ratio. In other words, only a few of the satellites in these various uh, orbital planes, low Earth orbit planes, would be in range of engaging a ballistic missile at any given time. But with 4,000, in most um, engagement scenarios, it actually afforded multiple engagement windows. And by contrast, the absentee ratio for our current sea-based or land-based ballistic missile interceptors can be 100% because unless you're shooting very close to those systems where they are deployed, uh, then you will have no opportunity to engage those ballistic missiles. So again, I, I'm just hoping that this is food for thought. It's something that I think, um, given uh, the fact that it's an unprecedented level of nu nuclear uh, saber rattling on the part of President Putin, uh, that um, this type of technology and these kind of strategic considerations need to be brought, <laughs> I can talk, need to be brought back into the mix. And um, of course, I would like it to be done in a very collaborative, allied manner. It needs to be a joint decision across many capitals. I don't believe the United States should go that alone. Um, but the final thing I'll leave you with is that, um, in my judgment, this will not in the end, uh, be a solely uh, Western decision. This technology is well known by the Chinese and the Russians. So um, I would not want them to be first to have this kind of capability. So I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, for uh, well, nicely connecting deterrence and space. And, and even space deterrence, you know, you didn't pronounce it, but. Once you have the brain pebbles in space, they need to be protected. <laughs> and uh, that's really um, um, something to, to think about. I will now hand over to uh, Colonel Ladislav Stahl from NATO. Please, you're on the floor. So the honorable guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, it's a really pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank organizers, organizers for being invited to this special and unique uh, conference. Uh, Today I am going to share and also discuss uh, with you an approach to the space deterrence uh, issue and also how NATO is uh, involved in the space domain. And also moreover, maybe I would like to open uh, discussion and also the rise the question if and when and how uh, the so-called red line uh, shall be defined so that uh, the even more efficient uh, space deterrence can be set up. So as far as the NATO, in November 2019, NATO declared space as an operational domain which will help to ensure a coherent approach to the integration of space into NATO's overall deterrence and defense posture. 
In October 2020, NATO established a NATO Space Center in Rammstein in Germany. Furthermore, a NATO Space Center of Excellence is being established in Toulouse in France. At the Brussels summit in 2021, NATO leaders reaffirm the growing importance of space for security and prosperity of allied nations and for NATO's deterrence and defense. NATO leaders stated that the secure access to the space services, products, and capabilities is essential for the conduct of alliance, operations, missions, and activities. The use of space has greatly enhanced alliances and NATO's ability to anticipate threats and respond to crises with greater speed, effectiveness, and precision. The evolution in the uses of space and uh, rapid advances of space technology have created new opportunities, but also risks, vulnerabilities, and potentially threats for the alliances and allies, security, and defense. Today, access to and use of space is not longer the privilege of a few nations that are technically capable of launching and operating a spacecraft. Space technology and services have become more readily accessible, cheaper, and more capable. In security and defense terms, space is increasingly contested, congested, and competitive, and requires the Alliance to be able to operate in a disrupted, denied, and degraded environment. It goes without saying that the space's unique physical domain, which is challenging allies, traditional perception of time, distance, and geography. Potential adversaries are developing, testing, and operationalizing sophisticated counter space capabilities. So now let's have a look at the deterrence issue. Space is an inherently global environment, and any conflict that extends into space has the potential to affect all users of space. Even in a case where NATO is not involved in the conflict, allies systems could be affected. Moreover, the space domain is considered to be part of the multi-domain military arena, and key actors and nations would probably expect to contest technical and information superiority. Space should be seen as an integral part of the Alliance's broad approach to deterrence and defense, drawing upon all of the tools of NATO's disposal to provide the Alliance with the broad range of options to be able to respond to any threats from wherever they arise. And for this purpose, first, any potential adversary must be aware that any of the activities can be persistently observed and monitored. Both intelligence support to the space domain and intelligence reliance on the space domain shall be continuously developed. Secondly, a contemporary intelligence and operational picture is deeply dependent on space ISR assets. As an, as an example, the Ukraine crisis shows the real need for and decisive for all of intelligence derived from space data, products, and services. A, comp a comprehensive and credible red picture, space better of order, shall be analyzed and provided in real time. All layers of space situation awareness, including space-based SSA, shall be accompanied by effective standard operational operating procedures able to respond what-if scenarios and to give a proper guideline on how to conduct space operations. In addition, space traffic management shall be optimized and orchestrated. Fourth, moreover, renewal of the space-based assets must be guaranteed and fixed under the foreseeable combat conditions. Following this, spaceport capabilities or ground station locations shall be enhanced by mobile platforms. Fifth, defensive counter space measures taken to protect and maintain access to friendly space K 
capabilities and services shall be implemented. For instance, such as patrolling satellites, masking techniques, and knowledge of adversaries capability development. And last but not least, offensive counter space actions that result in deception, disruption, denial, and degradation of adversary hostile activity should be also taken into consideration. Importantly, having a portfolio of capabilities to disable the technical function of the space assets with no production of space debris is critical. So in conclusion, I can mention that uh, a comprehensive combination of uh, cutting edge space technology, knowledge, capability development, multinational cooperation, investment, innovation and visions is the key element of effective space deterrence policy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. It's this conclusion of my speech. Thank you, Connor, for sharing with us these views from, from NATO on how to approach this. Uh, so we're going to address another aspect of a changing landscape. I have the pleasure to introduce Peter Marcus for this, and Peter, you have the floor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, and also, I want to thank Roger and Yana for once again uh, putting on what I consider the best space security conference every year, and thank you for bringing it back. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to a panel, which this is my sick hobby. When I, you know, people, when the question before, I think John asked, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night is studying deterrence, which is a sick, sick hobby. So I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, to be on this panel. Um, you may ask, why is somebody from the commercial sector talking to you about deterrence? I will tell you because the commercial companies, some single companies, are investing more in space than some country space agencies are. We have a vested interest in making sure that the space environment is one that can be used uh, now and in the future. So I'm going to start my discussion uh, by telling you a story and my thought on the phrase space deterrence. I have a daughter who likes to use her iPad to do things that do not involve her homework. She likes to watch cartoons and not the good stuff from Miyazaki or others. Uh, she will do anything it takes to avoid her homework. So what I do is I tell her, A, you are not to use your iPad for that. B, when you do, I have the servers and the network in the house set up so that I know when you're going to websites, so I know what you're doing. And see, when you go to those websites and aren't using your iPad for homework, you're going to be grounded for a week. What I have instituted is not iPad deterrence. I have instituted a deterrent scenario, a re deterrent regime to get my daughter to do her homework. So if you use the, spa the phrase space deterrence in front of me, know that I am silently judging you for not understanding deterrence. And then I will not silently judge you for not understanding deterrence. You deter actors, not a place. We want to deter actors from doing things in space that we don't like. So when you talk about space deterrence, you've got, you've got the wrong end of the stick. So you deter not a domain, you deter an actor. What I would also say is space deterring uh, and deterrence requires more than just the war fighting capabilities. If you are relying on General Shaw or relying on General Friedling or General Trout or Mike or anybody else to solve your deterrence problem for you, that is unfair to them. The entirety of the dime should be used to deter Diplomacy, intelligence, economic capabilities are all part of deterring what you, what you want people not to do in space. It is unfair to put this solely on the military community. Now, I talked about very briefly about what the elements of deterrence are when I told you the story about Claire. Don't tell Claire that I dimed her out for uh, not doing her homework. So if you see my daughter, say, oh, you do a great job with your homework. Um, so uh, there, there are five kind of key elements to deterrence, right? The, the first one that we all kind of know is d denial of benefit. It is, you can do something to me, but I can take the punch. I'm going to deny you the benefit of attacking me. The other one is cost imposition, which is, if you do this thing that I've told you not to do, 
then I'm going to make life very difficult for you. It's going to hurt. The other one is signaling. This is what is good behavior, and this is what is bad behavior. When I tell my daughter, you can use your iPad for this, but not for this, it's signaling. Attribution, knowing what is happening in space, being able to do it quickly and effectively and clearly. And then credibility. Do I have the capacity to do what I said I am going to do? Can I attribute you? Uh, can I impose costs? And can I deny benefit? Do all those things actually exist? So if I have all of those together, then I've got a deterrent capability. Now, I, let me take a little aside here. We'll go on another side trip here, not involving my daughter and her iPad. Um, there's been a discussion about maybe we need to modernize deterrence to take into account cyber and take into account space. My hypothesis is that no, the answer is no. There is no need to modernize deterrence. What you need to do is better understand what your adversaries are capable of and what you are capable of. Deterrence, people think, came about in World War II and during the nuclear era, and that is not true. You can go back to Thucydides and read the Peloponnesian War, and all the elements of deterrence are there. We just gave it names. So there's no need to modernize deterrence. What we need to do is understand how the world has become much more complex than what it was before. And we need to do deterrence against actors in different ways and be much more robust about our response options. So... I'm, I'm the commercial guy now, so I'll talk to you about commercial and where commercial industry can help. One of them is on signaling, uh, and I think we've had a really good discussion over the past few years on norms of behavior. Right? And I think that's an area where commercial companies can help government entities with what should be considered appropriate use of space. So let's signaling, I think we can help you there. Denial of benefit. That one, I would say, we can very much help with in the utilization of commercial systems for, to provide resilience. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm going to tell you another story related to Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, another great uh, space warrior. Um, resilience is not about building the most hardened satellite. Resilience is about making sure that you can conduct a mission, whatever that mission is, through whatever variety of means you need to accomplish that mission. So uh, in 2010, I had just finished the 2010 National Space Policy. There was a whole section on mission resilience. Fast forward about three, four years, I get called in to do an interview with uh, a certain federally funded research and development corporation that shall re remain nameless and wanted to talk about resilience because they were doing a study for the Air Force. And they said, well, we're doing this, we want to answer back to the Air Force how we're supposed to protect our satellites and what key elements we need and technologies we need to do to protect our satellites. I said, that's not the point of what the language says. That's not the point of the policy. The policy is about having mission resilience. And they said, well, no, that's not what we read out of it. And I said, well, look, here's the language, and this is what was meant. And they said, how, how would you know what was meant? I said, well, I, I know him. He, he's me. It's like when Obi-Wan was asked by Luke Skywalker, do you know Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yeah, I know him. He's me. Um, I knew what I meant when I wrote the language. It is not about gold plating satellites. It's about making sure the mission can be conducted. So that is through a variety of means, use of commercial capability, use of gov government capability, whatever it takes to get the job done, and not just through space, but through terrestrial capabilities and many other capabilities, defense in depth. Attribution, the other thing industry can help with. There is a lot uh, uh, that we can do. You heard from Paul earlier from ComSpock about SSA and SDA capability. Um, I will tell you that um, there is an effort underway inside the commercial community, and I can't say very much about it. There should be a very public display of it next month. Some of you may have seen it at Space Symposium. We did a very uh, we did a closed door discussion of, of what the capability is. Um, I, the, the best way I can summarize it, and hopefully you all get to see it next month, is um, industry got together to create the Amazon version of the one-click buy for SSA and SDA. Uh, what I saw industry put together was completely unbelievable, and when we've briefed it to the U.S. government, you know, getting back to the comment that Kevin O'Connell had earlier about, you know, you've got to move fast. I have never seen a capability like this in my life after spending years in the government, and I'm still surprised that the commercial industry put this capability together. And when we've briefed it to the government, the number one response we have gotten back is, is this real? You guys could not have done this. And the answer is yes, we did. So 
stay tuned. Big news coming out on SSA and SDA. Uh, and then the other part is on credibility, right? I mean, commercial companies have to show you that they are producing capability and have capability in space and elsewhere. If you're going to use those, then it shows that those capabilities are there. But let's talk about where we need to do more work. The first item gets back to my first point about it's, it's about the dime. It's not just about the military. Space is not special. It is not special. It is a domain for business, it is a domain for warfare, it is a domain for everything else for, for commerce. It is not special. Stop thinking about it as something special. We need to look at space as an integrated part of commercial capability, as part of diplomatic capability, as part of economic capability, and how that all fits into a larger deterrent structure. So again, where we need to work, make sure space is integrated into everything else. Another area where I think we should work is where I call it growing the family. I think all of us here uh, are here because we're part of a space environment, but what about countries and other actors who do not have the economic capability or the technical capability to start working in space to the level that many of us have? There is an opportunity between private entities, venture capital, and government development funds and development organizations to build capacity in places like Africa, Latin America, and Asia to bring other countries to work with us and to bring their industries to work with us. We're missing a tremendous opportunity on the economic part of the dime. Um, the other part here is uh, cybersecurity. Uh, that's, uh, I will speak as an AWS person. Cybersecurity at AWS is job number one. Uh, in the space community, I'm not quite sure where it racks and stacks in actual implementation. Um, and we've been good at it, we've been bad at it in places, but it is an inherent vulnerability where we need to go and take uh, some, some work. So those are some areas where we need to do work. The last thing I would say about deterrence is that it is not normative. It is not something that is written on paper and to be something that because we have a deterrent capability means we have stopped aggression means that we have stopped warfare. If you for a minute think that deterrence prevents warfare, then you haven't been paying attention at all in the past 5,000 years. You have to have the capabilities for when deterrence fails. And if they're not there, then it's gonna be a lot worse saying you had a deterrent capability when there wasn't one there. So be prepared for when it fails, have the capabilities and have the plans in place to respond. So anyway, thank you again, Yana, Roger. Thank you so much for having me, I appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for putting back the actor in the center of the debate, in a sense. It's a very human dimension, deterrence, anyway. And uh, now we get the floor to Namrata Goswami. Uh, open to uh, larger horizons. Hello. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, PSSI and Yana and your team. Uh, their hospitality, picking us up at one in the morning, that you, you have the best conference. <laughs> so, well, so uh, the esteemed chair actually tasked me with a very interesting problem, which is to look at the global US-China space picture. So the question that came to my mind when I was tasked with this particular question is, what is the China that we're actually dealing with? So the China that we're actually dealing with today in the words of President Xi Jinping, in a speech he gave to a combined meeting of PLA officers, including the strategic support force, is a civilizational state. So the construct that he put forward is that the key goal of China is to recognize that all history that it has led and maintained by the sole authority of the Communist Party of China and that national rejuvenation of the Chinese nation in the next 20 years is key. And I say this because if you look at how he has constructed space, it falls within that particular grand strategic thinking. And this is where I think sometimes Western constructs of understanding China gets it wrong. So if you look at China's assessment of strategic culture and its political culture, myths, History, metaphor play a very critical role. And political culture in the Chinese conception, it is what is limiting in its political culture as well that informs their decisions. And the assumptions of its threats and opportunities based on not just 
that grand strategic thinking, but also how space can enable its own operational context within uh, in, in the Pacific. And I'll talk a little bit about the concept of deterrence and compellence from the Chinese perspective. Now, if we look at the interesting departure for China in terms of its active defense operational doctrine, they changed it in 2015. So the usual argument is that it's about active def uh, defense and deterrence. That's the doctrinal guidance coming out of the military strategic guidelines, which is an internal document for Chinese military officers. But they also published a white paper called Military Strategy. And the document I would urge you to actually look at is the one that came out in 2015, because President Xi was the operational guiding light for that particular document. So for the first time in that document, China actually identified space as a key enabler of its military posture across domain. So joint operations and informization became key. Now this is a most interesting departure from my perspective. Usually under Deng Xiaoping, Hu Zintao, Jiang Zemin, China was about not taking the strategic initiative. It was about the peaceful rise of China and do not challenge the US-led international order. But that changed in 2015, when China argued that China is going to take the strategic initiative, including in space. The, do the doctrine is very interesting, it's defensive, but if you look at its operational capability, it's very offensive. It wants to target adversary capabilities, including attacks on the adversary society's critical infrastructure in order to deter. Now, this is not just coming out of the famous book called Unrestricted Warfare, which was published in the 1990s, but actually reflected in their doctrinal thinking. Now, in the Chinese strategic mind across a broad spectrum, there are certain assumptions, by which I mean ideas, decisions, and patterns that influence their behavior. So, our Japanese colleague talked about that. So, in a nutshell, the Chinese strategy of compellence is very different from how the Western understanding of compellence is. And it does not follow the classical Western escalatory ladder. Once a strategic purpose is fulfilled by the use of compellence and the message is delivered, which is strategic in intent, they actually de-escalate. And I'll give you an example of that. One is, of course, the South China Sea, where they induce compellence by building artificial islands in the South China Sea, basically inducing and compelling countries like the Philippines and Vietnam to accept that reality, but then they de-escalate it in terms of posture. India is a classic example of misunderstanding China's strategy of compellence to de-escalate. So in the 1960s, as you know, India-China had a border conflict, and Mao uh, advised the People's Liberation Army to attack India a behavior of compellence to change India's behavior in regard to its forward policy. Now, Nehru made a big miscalculation, thinking that China will escalate the conflict to total war. He wrote to John F. Kennedy for help, including the US Air Force. But if you look at uh, declassified documents coming out of China, Mao never had them. His idea was to compel India to give up its behavior of forward policy and building posts in the border, and then de-escalate. And so Nehru could not understand why China unilaterally withdrew. So I think it's really critical when we think about China from the space domain perspective to keep three things in mind. One is the civilizational construct. Second, that its understanding of deterrence and compellence is very different. And learning lessons about supply chain, for example, from the Falkland War that the British fought in the 1980s, the Gulf War that the US fought, China has actually now included space as a part of its critical deterrence to compel behavior. Now, it is in this context that I'll talk about US-China space posture. Now, we use the word competition a lot. What do we mean by it? So I define competition as states jockeying to get the most advantageous position and denying it to competing others. Competition includes microaggression that challenges easy cooperation. US-Russia, China, India-China, this would include provocations, but not all-out war, over which value system, liberal or authoritarian, would shape the international order. And we see that struggle happening as we speak today. I would argue that Russia would not have dared to invade Ukraine if President Xi and Putin had not met before uh, the invasion in February during the Olympics, and China signed a 6,000-word joint statement with Russia, where if you look at the wordings, 
China agreed with the Russian position, saying that NATO operational development in the Ukraine challenges Russian legitimacy and is something that China does not agree with. So if that particular reassurance had not come, it might have compelled Putin to think otherwise, but it did come from China. So now, how is the US-China place in this particular framework that I have given you? I would argue among five points, and I'll end there. First, there is a competition for global influence, by which I do not mean all-out war, but basically to argue and put forward which system is more compelling and will offer space leadership to the world. And the audience is not the West solely. It's countries like India, Africa, Latin America, and those countries are signing on to China's construction of, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative Space Information Corridor, which is about 139 members. Now let's look at it from that systemic construct. China has the BRI, Special Information Corridor, that promises to advance infrastructure in countries across uh, countries that require it, a point that was made by my colleague. The U.S. really does not have a similar infrastructure proposal, since I've been asked to look at that particular framing. It does have the Artemis Accord, but if a country which is not an allied country looks at the Artemis Accord framing, it's a lot about sending American astronauts back to the moon by 2028. So a country like India would look at that and think, what is there for me in this particular construct, right? And whereas China's language is very different, it sounds more generous. Of course, we know the underlying strategic signaling. Now, uh, China's key goal, and that they have taken decision for it, is to establish itself as a lead player in space by 2045, in time to meet its celebration of the 100th year establishment of the PRC. The US goal is to maintain itself as the lead actor. So China is a revisionist system, and because of that civilizational construct, it is also challenging territorial revision. For example, claim on Taiwan, claim on Tibet, claim on the South China Sea, and now increasing presence in Antarctica and by extension in space. Now, this is a critical departure between China and the US. China recognizes the economic value of space as an end goal. So everything that it's building towards, including its military, is about economic development. In the words of President Xi Jinping, a country that is economically advanced will naturally become a lead actor because then you'll be able to develop your other dime capabilities. The US is very unclear. The US focus is a lot on contributing to earth science, military operations, and I have noticed in my conversations in the US that there is a tendency to underestimate China's capability a lack of understanding of China's strategic culture and also an ethnocentric understanding of the world, which can actually lead to blindness to a large extent. Now, China has also recognized the moon as a key factor in terms of the global competition. Cislunar focus was highlighted in China's white paper of 2021. And the moment it gets to the white paper, it means that there is funding and there is a policy construct. In the US, it's unclear. So we talk about the moon, but we do not talk about it from a cislunar perspective at the national level. The Space Force doctrine talks about it, but very little. Now, China has articulated the concept of a China dream in terms of its space vision. President Xi Jinping gave this speech in Kazakhstan and, so, and then in Moscow. And so the vision for that was set out in 2013. It's an old vision. The US does not have a similar space vision at the international level. Now, the China-Russia strategic partnership is key to this particular leadership that China wants to take up. And I just recently wrote a piece in which I challenged some of the assumptions coming out of the West that the China-Russia relationship is an opportunistic relationship. No, if you look at the documents that they have signed since 2001, uh, pushed by Hu Jintao, and then President Xi gave a speech, I urge you to listen to it, in 2013 in Moscow, where he said that the China-Russia strategic partnership is the most important partnership for China, and then they would develop it. And so finally, I'll end with this particular caution in terms of understanding the China-Russia, uh, China-U.S. space competition. So when we talk about strategic culture, and I'll get back to my first construct that I used to understand China, a famous American scholar, Jack Snyder, he actually critiqued the US game theoretic models of rationality drawn from American strategic rationality, which actually failed to predict Soviet Union's strategic behavior vis-a-vis -vis its nuclear strategy. So you see this particular failure again in understanding China's role, who it is, 
what its civilizational construct is. And then I'll throw a question to the audience because I know we have those amongst us who has deep understanding of Russia. So when I was reading Russia's military doctrine in order to understand its nuclear escalatory posture, so in some of the doctrines that Russia put out since 2004, the Russian strategic thinker pointed out that Russia would threaten nuclear weapon use so that it can control the escalatory ladder in conventional terms. And so it's a signaling so that you can bring down the level of conflict and to ensure that the conflict does not include Western conventional active participation. And so in that, and so I'll end there by saying that it's critical that when we look at China, uh, US space cooperation or competition, we need to really keep two factors, strategic culture, what China wants and what its identity and belief system is, and that it does want to replace the US as the lead actor in space within the next 20 years. And, and its concept of deterrence and compelence is very different from the Western concept. So I'll end there and thank you. Thank you very much, Namrata, for this uh, perspective uh, enlarging our debate. And it, it's, it sounds like when I'm after listening to our presentations that uh, well, cross dam and deterrence uh, uh, will be key when we talk about uh, maintaining space, a uh, stable one, a safe environment. Uh, with different categories of action, as Peter mentioned, that can be military, that can be non-military, and en englobing everything. And, and then uh, um, the, the current situation reminds me about how much uh, strategic dialogue in the same time is, is key. And my question may be to the panelists as a first question for opening the discussion, how to reconcile or to reconcile a capability-based approach, uh, you know, uh, building on a, a build-up system and on, on, on technological advance, at the same time, we need to maintain the strategic dialogue. It's always been a, a, a dilemma in any uh, strategic situations, not only involving space, involving many, many other domains, but in space it's going to be maybe more uh, acute because of uh, um, the technological aspect, you know, uh, very much... Uh, uh, with a lot of weight, I mean, in the relationship. So it seems to be, and Namrata mentioned the cultural differences, different perspectives, and, and, and the long-term goals. Um, it seems to me that one key element will be how to reconcile these two things, keeping the, the technological edge while maintaining the strategic dialogue. So I don't know if you have um, ideas on how to reconcile this. Um, it seems, for example, interesting to consider that we all recognize that we have to protect our space assets, that our space assets are precious and, and might, be, uh, might deserve special protection and even special reactions while we can discuss these issues collectively at the same time and be, in a sense, collectively responsible. So it's interesting to see how these discussions, because of the new actors, because we're talking about infrastructures in space that are useful and critical for countries, and for development and for, and for, for human reasons, that these things need to be taken seriously when it comes to how we confront each other. And so maybe I would like to have a, your, your view on this. Do we need to invent something new to discuss these issues? Can we use existing mechanisms, uh, maybe uh, multilateral platforms that would be used for that? Do we need to recreate a strategic dialogue? in the context of these technological critical issues. I know it's a hard question, so maybe I could leave some minutes for you and ask for uh, the audience to, to, to ask some questions, but I think this is something that is very deep in, in, in our discussion for, for yours too. You want to react on this? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. You pointed uh, the proper question as far as the technology. I would say that uh, uh, the, the, in our case, the deterrence must be driven by technological superiority by the Western part of the, the world, for instance, because this is, this is the key uh, how we can move forward. And uh, you mentioned the cross-domain cross deterrence. For instance, in this case, you know, if I will take into consideration like GSA, like Joint Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance, uh, it, it cannot be only the, the space-based ISR, but uh, this type of in the, in the intelligence can be supported by 
so-called uh, pseudo-satellites from the stratosphere, altitude, and so on, so that uh, the common intelligence picture is even more enhanced and uh, the full mosaic of GISR is, is, is embedded. So this is the key. But also, uh, you know, on the, first, on the first hand, you have the technical superiority, but on the other hand, you know, everything must, must be compli compliance with uh, the political decisions. An example, for instance, also, I think that during the presentation, uh, it was mentioned by Major General uh, Mikhail Traut. He mentioned that, uh, or maybe what I understood that, you know, for the time being, I would say that uh, as far as the SSA and S SST, we are able to really to cover quite uh, quite lots of objects uh, flying over, uh, flying in in, in, in space. Uh, we are able to, let's say, to, to predict uh, collision maneuvers uh, and, uh, and so on. But on the other end, what is missing? So it means that we have a proper picture, even, even though that we can integrate uh, the information coming from commercial companies. This, this, this is something which is very efficient, important. But on the other hand, you know, th there is the stop. And also what I already mentioned in, in my text. So the question is, what if? I think that we are not ready to, to maybe we are ready to have the discussion, but we are not Already, maybe we don't want to to decide uh, and to early to uh, to set up the stand SOPs. What to do if there will be this 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 case scenario? Yeah? And this this must be like an, an enhanced uh, technolo technological in, uh, involvement uh, and also the separate, but also some kind of the political guidelines because this is probably uh, only uh, the uh, let's say the part of the politicians uh, who can decide how to how to how to act and how to react uh, if there is some kind of the threat uh, coming to our uh, space based assets thank you thank you very much uh we'll we'll come back to these issues anyway i'm sure so i will uh you want Pete? yeah i mean you asked do we need a new construct um I, I would say um, we probably don't need a new construct, but I think we need to um, maybe unlearn some of the constructs from the Cold War and the nuclear dimension. I mean, it, it was uh, reasonable to say deterrence couldn't fail with nuclear weapons. I'm glad about that, and it didn't fail. Um, but to the extent that we bring that thinking into space and the idea that deterrence can't you know, fail, it, uh, of course it can fail, and we need to... Um, you know, consider how uh, particularly the Russians and Chinese both have um, basically escalate to de-escalate types of, of strategies. So, um, you know, I would submit that our thinking about this needs to catch up with where our adversaries are and what they value and how they are um, thinking about these issues. So to me, it's not really a new construct so much as um, recognizing the limitations inherent um, from thinking about this in a nuclear construct, because that's not what space is all about. And we're, we're using space in operational ways every day in ways that we never, thankfully, use nuclear weapons. Namata, you want to? Yeah. Yeah, I think I, first of all, great question in terms of strategic dialogue, right? So. Well, uh, I think I agree with uh, Peter. So once I have uh, offered you my construct, how do you deal with this? So I think one way is to also understand that China also has strategic vulnerabilities because it's starting to depend more and more on space as well, uh, including in the Taiwan uh, conflict. And they also recognize that. So in a sense that how can we build a mapping of their vulnerability? This is just speaking from the operational point of view. But I think from the strategic point of view, I think Japan is doing a great job. So I think former Japanese uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was the man who actually gave us the idea of the quadrilateral security dialogue in 2007. He was the first person to realize that if you really want to have a strong democratic, if I may counter, to China's constant questioning of borders, territory, you need to have a countervailing strategic partnership. And so, but I would still argue that even within the quadrilateral security dialogue, I think space cooperation, if you look at 
the construct, they include four, three major spacefaring nations. The US, Japan, India, all with independent launch capability. Australia, of course, is a junior partner, but has a space agency as well since 2018 and has established a space command. Now, if you look at the construct of that, space cooperation is limited to climate change and understanding Earth science. I think it should be upgraded to include not just space situational awareness, but also operational understanding and understanding this challenge of China and China's challenge, including with anti-satellite weapons to critical space infrastructure of the four uh, partner nations. So I think the construct has to be, in your dime, it has to be much larger than just operational construct. It should be strategic. Thank you. Thank you, Namrata. So are there any questions from the audience? Can I see? Uh, no. Everything is perfectly. Yeah. You want? Yeah. Uh, maybe I, I can add some information which can arise the questions. As far as the, maybe the strategical construct or maybe strategical um, thinking of the space domain itself, maybe for the future I would, uh, I will, I would consider also the moon the moon to be part of the, the space domain itself. I mean, the moon lunar activity, because probably, uh, you know, you have to also include uh, the moon itself and also its outer space, I mean, the surroundings. Uh, this can be also the one of the construct which uh, must be taken into consideration as far as the space domain. Yeah, thank you for bringing up this also this complementary uh, aspect, and it's, it's it's clear that what what we can see uh, if if we look at what happened for a few years from a distance, it, it feels like we are enlarging uh, the Earth, you know, up to the to the sky, with, and we and we take with us our confrontations, our objectives, our desires, I would say, and the whole life is getting deported into space, and and certainly. Uh, in the two or three next decades, the moon environment and the Earth-Moon uh, space will be a very much terrestrial space, in a sense, uh, philosophically speaking, and where we will have to coexist. Uh, it's interesting to say that this morning we discussed this STM thing. You know, it's just a way of coexisting in space because technology allows us doing things better than before, and doing things better than before uh, uh, allows us thinking about well, if I can heal a bit space in a different manner, then I may try to uh, push my interests, objectives, uh, or alliances, etc., etc. So it seems to me that the next years, all the questions we're reading here will be central questions more and more for the next years. And by the way, Peter, you mentioned this importance of private actors. We'll have economy in space with all what it means, uh, confrontations, competitions, uh, whatever, uh, uh, relationships. So, I think the notion of deterrence, cross domain deterrence, is also intrinsically linked to this multiplicity of human activities in space that will develop, you know. Uh, until recently, space was just an experiment, in a sense. I shouldn't say so, I mean, space was more than that. But just, just uh, you know, uh, in theory, space was just, you were just doing orbits, and then once it's finished, you go back. You, know, you don't hear about space like this. But when you plan to do things, to, to move to maybe with new technologies, electric propulsion, all the things, you know, you begin to mesh your space. And then when you mesh your space, you inhabit it from an anthropological perspective. And then you bring with you everything you do on Earth. So I think this is clearly, uh, I think this, this panel is very timely. It's, we need to think, yeah, strategically in a sense, because we're going to inhabit space in a new manner, it seems to me. So uh, um, it goes much beyond only military dimension, that's for sure. Um, so I think we are right on spot here. Are there any questions for? Yes. I think this might be good for uh, Goswami or Marquez. Uh, my name is Adam Hayes from the US Embassy here in Prague. Uh, when we speak about China, I think sometimes rightly or wrongly, we think about it as sort of this monolith, the PRC, um, where public policy, um, there's, there's not really a necessity for public discourse or um, political will, if you will. It's whatever the PRC decides that it wants to do is what they'll do. 
And when we talk about deterrence, um, Mr. Marquez, you brought up this idea that every agency should be involved within the government. It needs to be sort of an all-hands-on-deck approach to that, which oftentimes, particularly in the U.S., requires some political will. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, when we're countering China sometimes and we're countering them on these issues, it takes substantial political will from the West, but within that democratic structure, that can be very, very difficult. Is the private sector sometimes a way around that? Is that a way to put funding into something and have significant power to push back against an authoritarian regime that doesn't have to worry about the political will? No. <laughs> no, you can't substitute commercial capability for the, the, the needs of a nation state and what the nation state is able to do. I mean, poli sci 101 tells me that one of the hallmarks of a nation state is that it has a monopoly on violence. And I mean that in an academic way. Um, that's not a place where you want companies involved. Um, force projection, force application, intelligence activities. No. Having run the interagency before, I am very much aware of how difficult it is getting a whole of government response. But we're not talking about a whole of government response here. We're talking about an allied response to be truly effective. So this is much harder than just doing an interagency activity. And trust me, there are many days I wanted to jump out of the window. So this is going to be a window jumping exercise for many of you all around the world to get this done and get it done right. It's not easy, and there's no substitute, and there's no way around. Thank you, Peter. Are there any other, other questions? Oh, Jana. Yeah, this is maybe for uh, Peter and Namrata and Peter and Peter. <laughs> uh, just to follow up, do we have any case study or something that can tell us that we have successfully deterred either via uh, the space domain or using the space domain or involving the space domain? Well, so it, it depends on when you say space domain, uh, what capability, right? So I'll give you one capability which I think has, for example, deterred Russia from using space as a bargaining leverage. And that's where the question about private sector comes in. So before May 2021, the U.S. did not have a launch capacity to the ISS. And so May 2021, SpaceX launched its uh, commercial crew to the ISS. Now, what does it mean in terms of national security and grand strategic capability? This means that during the Ukraine war, Russia could not use that as a bargaining leverage to limit US response, because it tried to do that during the 2008 Georgian invasion when American astronauts depended on the Soyuz capsule, right? So, I mean, it doesn't answer directly your question in terms of how we have a case study where we have used space, but Peter might know something, but at least I see this as a great contribution of the U.S. private sector to U.S. overall strategic posturing. That said, if the U.S. does not have a grand strategic vision like China is having, your private sector might develop capability without that overarching vision and might not end in competitive edge in the long term. So, like cislunar space, there is no identification of cislunar space at the national policy level. Thank you, Peter. Well, I, I can't come up with something like that. It's a great question. Um, you know, what I learned in Political Science 101 is that uh, deterrence is a flawed uh, logical concept because we're trying to impute causality to something that didn't happen. So that's not what a, you know, philosopher would ever want to do. It made sense when we're trying to never have a nuclear war. But, um, you know, that's what I was trying to suggest, that um, our construct needs to include failures of deterrence for space because I think we've already seen them and um, uh, we need to be thinking about ways to strengthen um, deterrence. But, you know, the construct itself is not, um, it's not a great one to study and I'm, I'm sure that keeps Pete up at night. Yeah, so there, there really isn't. So to, to 
follow Pete Primes, uh, I'll be Pete Beta or whatever. Um, Kissinger was asked the same question when he was in the White House. Can you prove to me that deterrence works? And deterrence is, is the keeping of the status quo. So it's really hard to prove that something didn't happen uh, and you're keeping the status quo, right? So, so it's really hard to prove that. Now, what I would say, and this gets way too wonky and way too down in the weeds real quick, but there are many cases where you're actually, in, regarding space security issues, in a compellent state and not in a deterrent state. And that is in a scenario where you have adversaries or other actors who have a capability and have demonstrated the capability uh, and you're concerned about them using it. And what you would look for is, did they give up use of that weapon system? Did they give up use of that capability? Now that's a different environment. Compellence requires a lot more resources than deterrence does. But, but to answer your question very succinctly, no, it's hard to prove that you didn't change the status quo. Thank you, Peter. Yes, a last question here. So I'd like to ask uh, Peter Hayes, uh, just to answer some basic questions about uh, the proposal. So um, you know, if we were to suddenly you know, orbit 4,000 brilliant pebbles, um, just the basic questions about what would the impact of that be on debris creation? Why would we assume that those would be secure for our own command and control and not cyber vulnerable? And then, you know, what happens when that induces uh, comparative behavior by the other side that now can use that for a broader purpose than just missile defense, but compellence and, uh, you know, denial of space launch or some type of, uh, uh, of a Earth blockade? Uh, so thanks, Pete. Uh, that's uh, a great starting point for thinking about this. And I don't want to suggest that, you know, uh, political scientists talk about the fallacy of the last move. I mean, we're not going to get the last move on this. No one is. It's going to be a continuing uh, dialectic. What I am suggesting, though, is that um, this is something that is uh, in our potential toolkit. And um, I don't like people threatening us with nuclear war or denying um, uh, entry into NATO, uh, you know, there, there were some very specific threats made that I think are unprecedented. And I'm suggesting that these kind of capabilities might help to um, deter them. I'd also just like to go back to uh, Pete's point and, and Yana's um, question. I mean, in my opinion, one of the best things DOD came up with was a four-part typology, which was assure, dissuade, deter, defeat. So. I mean, there's lots of ways to slice this up, but um, to me, that's a great way of looking at the various tools at the disposal of um, militaries and thinking about which tool to use in which situation. Um, you know, with respect to your specific questions, yeah, you bet. There's, there's all kinds of issues, um, you know, and would we want the Russians and the Chinese to have such a system? No, we wouldn't. What would it do for uh, space? control types of issues, because you better believe if you can schwack a uh, ICBM, guess what you can do to a satellite. So yeah, there's, there's huge issues. I'm not denying that. Um, but again, the technology is there. It ain't that expensive in the grand scheme of things. We demonstrated it 30 years ago. And, um, you know, ultimately, it may not be our decision. So um, I think it just has to be a part of the mix. And I'm you know, I'm not saying we rush out and do this. Uh, I would like to do it in a very uh, collaborative manner with all uh, like-minded parties. Um, and maybe, you know, you can dissuade the Russians and the Chinese from doing such a thing. I don't know. Okay, thank you, Pete. So many thanks to each of our panelists for bringing in your complimentary views on this uh, complex subject. And I thank the audience also for that. Other question, thank you.